Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. I was always close to my parents. They supported me through college, cheered me on at my first job, and were over the moon when I introduced them to my partner. So when we got engaged, I was thrilled to share the news with them. My mom's reaction was intense. She squealed, hugged me tight, and immediately started rattling off ideas for the big day. At first, I was touched by her enthusiasm, but then things took a strange turn. One evening, while we were having dinner, she casually mentioned that she and my father would be celebrating their 25th anniversary soon. She suggested that it would be perfect if they renewed their vows during our wedding ceremony. I laughed, thinking she was joking. I told her it was a good one, shaking my head. She didn't laugh back. Instead, she leaned forward, eyes sparkling. She insisted she was serious and that it would be so special, calling it a double celebration. I looked at my fiancé, who looked equally horrified. I told my mom that it wasn't going to happen and that this was our wedding day. She tried to persuade me, saying it would be meaningful to celebrate two generations of love together. I stood my ground, explaining that we wanted our day to be about us. She pouted but dropped the subject, or so I thought. Over the next few weeks, she brought it up constantly. She'd call me with ideas that always circled back to her vow renewal. When I tried to discuss our actual wedding plans, she'd find a way to insert her anniversary into the conversation. It all came to a head during a family dinner. My mom cleared her throat and stood up. She announced to everyone that they had decided to make the wedding extra special. She declared that not only would they be celebrating us, but she and my father would be renewing their vows too. The table fell silent. My fiancé squeezed my hand under the table. I confronted my mom, reminding her that we never agreed to that and that this was our wedding, not her vow renewal. She accused me of being selfish, suggesting we could split the costs, calling it a win-win situation. I felt my blood boiling. Years of pent-up frustration bubbled to the surface. I refused, stating it was our day and we weren't sharing it. When she tried to argue, I cut her off, telling her that I'd already said no and that badgering me wouldn't change my answer. She accused me of being ridiculous and tried to guilt-trip me about everything they'd done for me. At that point, I had enough. I stood up grabbing my fiancé's hand and announced we were leaving. I informed my mom that she was on an information diet from then on, with no more wedding details for her. I heard her wailing to my dad about how ungrateful I was, but for once, I didn't care. Over the next few months, planning our wedding became a stealth operation. We didn't tell my mom anything. Not the venue, not the caterer, nothing. When she'd call to ask, I'd simply say that it had been taken care of and changed the subject. She tried everything. Guilt trips, tantrums, even showing up at my house unannounced with cake samples for the vow renewal. Each time I stood my ground, repeating that I'd already said no and ending the conversation. Eventually she seemed to get the message. She stopped bringing it up and I foolishly thought we were in the clear. The day of the wedding arrived. Everything was perfect, until I saw my mom walk in wearing a white dress. My maid of honor intercepted her before I could explode. She politely told my mom she couldn't wear that dress and offered her a lovely blue dress they had as a backup. When my mom tried to protest, my maid of honor gave it to her, telling her to change or she wouldn't be allowed in. Grudgingly, my mom changed. The ceremony went off without a hitch, but as we moved to the reception, I saw her eyeing the DJ's microphone. I nodded to my new spouse who smoothly stepped in and gave the DJ a list of approved speakers. When my mom realized she wouldn't be making any surprise announcements, she stomped over to me, fuming. She demanded to know how I could do this to her, insisting it was supposed to be their special day too. I calmly reminded her that this was our special day, and hers was 25 years ago. I told her that if she couldn't respect that, she was welcome to leave. She dramatically declared that if this was how I wanted it, she would leave. My mother then proceeded to storm towards the exit, making a scene as she went. She knocked over a chair, 
bumped into a waiter carrying drinks and slammed the door on her way out. For the rest of the night, I focused on celebrating with the people who were truly happy for us. My father, looking embarrassed and conflicted, came to apologize on my mother's behalf before leaving quietly. It wasn't the wedding I'd always dreamed of, but in a way, it was better, because this time I'd found my voice and used it. When I finally saved up enough to buy this property with its sprawling forest, it felt like a dream come true. I spent years fixing up the old farmhouse, planting a garden, and getting to know the land. My two dogs, a pair of loyal German shepherds, became my constant companions. We'd spend hours exploring the woods, watching deer graze in the meadows, and listening to the birds sing. It was paradise. But paradise doesn't last forever, I guess. It started on a crisp autumn morning. I was out for a walk with the dogs when I heard gunshots echoing through the trees. At first, I thought it might be coming from a neighboring property. But as we got closer, I realized the sounds were coming from my own land. I quickened my pace with a racing heart. As we rounded a bend in the trail, I saw them. Three men in hunting gear, rifles in hand, standing over the body of a young deer. On. My. Property. I shouted at them, demanding to know what they were doing. The men turned, startled. One of them, a tall guy with a scraggly beard, stepped forward. He replied casually, stating the obvious that they were hunting. I informed them that this was private property and they were trespassing. The bearded guy tried to brush it off, saying it was just a little hunting and no harm was done. I disagreed, pointing out that killing animals on my land without permission was illegal. I told them to pack up and leave immediately, or I'd call the cops. The men grumbled, but eventually gathered their gear in the deer carcass. As they trudged past me, the bearded guy muttered a threat under his breath. I should have taken that threat more seriously. A week later, I heard gunshots again. This time, they were closer to the house. I grabbed my phone and ran outside the dogs at my heels. We hadn't gone far when I saw them. The same three men brazenly hunting on my land again. I yelled at them, warning that I was going to call the police right away. I pulled out my phone, but before I could dial, one of the men turned and pointed his rifle at my dogs. He warned me not to make the call. Everything happened so fast after that. My dogs, sensing the threat, started barking and moving towards the men. The hunter squeezed the trigger. I heard a yelp of pain as one of my dogs went down. In that moment, something in me snapped. I ran back to the house, my wounded dog limping behind me, and grabbed my own hunting rifle. When I returned, the men were still there, laughing and high-fiving each other. I ordered them to get off my property immediately. They turned, surprised turning to anger when they saw my rifle. The bearded guy taunted me, asking if I was really going to shoot them and calling me City Boy. I warned them that I would shoot if I had to, giving them one last chance to leave. Instead of leaving, the bearded guy raised his rifle. I didn't think, I just reacted. I fired a warning shot, aiming to the side. But the bearded guy flinched, and the bullet grazed his arm. He went down, howling in pain and outrage. His buddies dropped their weapons, suddenly looking a lot less tough. I told everyone not to move and announced that I was calling the police and an ambulance. The next few hours were a blur of sirens, questions, and paperwork. The police took statements from everyone and I showed them the property lines and the evidence of the men's trespassing and poaching. In the end, all three men were arrested. They're facing charges for trespassing, illegal hunting, animal cruelty, and assault. My injured dog needed surgery, but is recovering well. I've installed security cameras around the property and started a neighborhood watch program with other landowners in the area. We're determined to protect our land and the wildlife that calls it home. It's not the peaceful country life I imagined, but I won't let a few entitled jerks ruin my dream. This land is my home and I'll do whatever it takes to defend it and the creatures who live here from those who think they can take what isn't theirs. I've been a chef for most of my life. Cooking's been my passion since I was a kid. Watching my grandma whip up amazing meals in her tiny kitchen. I worked my way up from dishwasher to head chef at some pretty fancy restaurants over the years. But as I got older, the long hours and stress started taking a toll on my health. 
My doctor told me I needed to slow down, so I decided to wind down my career and take an office job just to keep busy. It was a big change, going from running a kitchen to sitting at a desk. But I figured I could at least enjoy some good lunches. I'd bring in homemade gourmet sandwiches, stuff like banh mi, Cuban sandwiches, you name it. My co-workers were always eyeing my food enviously. We had this community fridge where everyone kept their lunches. You'd think adults would know better, but there was always someone stealing food. My lunches seemed to disappear more often than others, probably because word got around about how good they were. I had a pretty good idea who the thief was, this accountant guy. Let's call him the Lunch Bandit. He'd been on a stealing spree for days, and I was getting fed up. Now, here's something you should know about me. I don't just cook. I also run a hot sauce company on the side. We're talking serious heat here, not your grocery store stuff. I decided it was time to teach the lunch bandit a lesson he wouldn't forget. One day, I made a big, beautiful banh mi sandwich. But this time, I added a secret ingredient to the mayo. Trinidad scorpion pepper powder. If you don't know, that's one of the hottest peppers in the world. I'm talking melt your face off hot. I put the sandwich in the fridge and waited. About an hour before lunch, I noticed a lunch bandit sneaking towards the break room. Sure enough, when I checked later, my sandwich was gone. I hung around near the bathrooms. That's where he usually hid to eat his stolen goods. Soon enough, I heard some pretty nasty sounds coming from inside. Coughing, gagging, and then full-on vomiting. I casually walked in trying to keep a straight face. There he was, red-faced, eyes watering, drool everywhere. It was both gross and deeply satisfying. I asked him if he was alright, commenting that he didn't look so good. The lunch bandit, between coughs, managed to say he wasn't feeling well and might need to go home. I pretended to be concerned and asked if he had eaten something bad. Looking guilty and miserable, he mumbled that he must have. I told him I hoped he'd feel better soon and suggested that maybe he should be more careful about what he eats in the future. He didn't respond, just groaned and hurried out of the bathroom. He was gone for the rest of that day and all of the next. When he came back, he looked pretty sheepish. I noticed he started bringing his own lunch after that. Funny how that works, huh? A few days later, I was in the break room when the lunch bandit came in. He looked nervous and couldn't quite meet my eyes. He asked if he could talk to me for a second. I agreed, asking what was up. The lunch bandit then stammered out an apology. He admitted that he knew it was my sandwich he took the other day and all those other times too. He said he was really sorry. I pretended to be surprised and asked what made him decide to confess. Looking embarrassed, the lunch bandit explained that after what happened, he realized how wrong it was. He mentioned it could have been dangerous, pointing out that he could have had allergies or gotten really sick. I nodded, agreeing that you never know what might be in someone else's food. The lunch bandit then reiterated his apology and promised it wouldn't happen again to anyone. I told him I appreciated the apology and was glad he learned something from this. After that, the lunch theft stopped completely. Word got around about what happened to the lunch bandit, though no one could prove anything. But everyone started being a lot more respectful of other people's food. When I finally saved up enough to buy my own place, I was thrilled. The house wasn't anything fancy, but it had a decent-sized backyard with a pool, something I'd always dreamed of having. For the first few years, everything was great. I'd have the occasional barbecue, invite the neighbors over for a swim, and generally enjoy the peace and quiet of suburban life. That all changed when she moved in next door. At first, I thought we'd get along just fine. She seemed friendly enough, always waving and stopping to chat when we'd see each other outside. But looking back, I should have seen the red flags from the start. It began innocently enough. She knocked on my door one hot summer afternoon, kids in tow, asking if they could take a dip in my pool. I didn't see the harm in it, so I agreed. Big mistake. What started as an occasional request quickly turned into a regular occurrence. Before I knew it, she was showing up almost daily sometimes even when I wasn't home. I'd come back from work to find wet footprints leading from my backyard to her house. I tried to be understanding. Maybe she was just lonely and looking for some company. But things took a turn for the worse one Saturday afternoon. 
I had just gotten back from running errands when I heard music and laughter coming from my backyard. Confused, I went to investigate. Lo and behold, there she was, along with a group of people I'd never seen before having a full-blown pool party in my backyard. There were inflatable pool toys, coolers full of drinks, and even a portable grill set up on my patio. I stormed out, ready to give her a piece of my mind. I angrily asked what was going on. She looked up, surprised to see me, but not nearly as apologetic as she should have been. She casually replied that they were just having a little get-together and hoped I didn't mind. I told her that of course I minded, pointing out that this was my property and she didn't even ask permission. She shrugged it off, saying that since I wasn't using it, she figured it was fine and mentioned how hot the day was and that the kids were dying to swim. I explained that, while I understood she enjoyed using the pool, she couldn't just come over whenever she wanted, especially when I wasn't home. I stressed that she needed to ask permission first. She tells me not to make such a big deal out of it and that they'd clean up when they were done. A week later, there was a knock at my door. I opened it to find her standing there with a piece of paper in her hand and a determined look on her face. She told me she'd been thinking about our little chat and had come up with some rules for using the pool. I told her that this was my pool and I wasn't going to follow any rules she made up. She accused me of being selfish, telling me to think of the children and that I was ruining the neighborhood spirit with my attitude. I fired back, pointing out that she was the one who'd been using my pool without permission and was now trying to tell me how to use it. She angrily replied that if that's how I wanted to be, I shouldn't expect any invitations to the neighborhood barbecues. With that, she took off. I went out and bought a sturdy lock for my fence gate. The next day, I installed it and made sure my security camera had a clear view of the entrance. Just as I finished, I saw her walking across her lawn towards me, kids in tow and already dressed for swimming. She demanded to know what I thought I was doing. I explained that I was securing my property and informed her that she and her family were no longer welcome here. I warned her that if she trespassed again, I'd call the authorities. She protested, claiming they had rights. I told her that they didn't have any rights on my property and asked her to leave before I had to involve the police. She stood there, mouth agape, before turning on her heel and storming off, yelling about lawyers and homeowners associations. I realized I should have set boundaries from the start, but at least now I can enjoy my backyard in peace, knowing that my pool is my own again. And if she tries anything else, well, let's just say I've got it all on camera. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.